and welcome to the Hoop Collective Podcast. We talk about the NBA, which we are doing on Thursday afternoon. Joining us from New York City, where it's opening day in baseball and another exciting season for the New York Mets, Tim Bontemps. It's the one hat I have in my house, so I'm wearing it, and it's 48 degrees and raining on what was supposed to be opening day. So March 28th, shockingly, not baseball season in New York City. McMahon, Texas is only big enough for one of us. I'm in Texas right now, the University of Texas at Austin. That means you had to get out. Joining us from Oklahoma City, getting out of my way, Ben McMahon. Howdy, partners, just across the Red River here. Hey, if we're talking about baseball, though, shout out Texas Rangers, defending World Series champions. First time I've ever been able to, to say that. That's true. I would not have remembered who the champions were. You would have had to have reminded me. So, um, uh, and yes, and also shout out to the uh, University of Texas here and the uh, McCombs Business School who's hosting me today and letting me you uh, do my uh, our podcast from here. All right. University um, of Texas will be getting a significant chunk of my money starting next fall. Congratulations to your daughter who's going to be a Longhorn. That's right. It's uh, it's a it's a Chamber of Commerce Department of Admissions Day here in Austin today. It's about seventy eight degrees. There's not a cloud in the sky, <laughs> and campus is very alive. Uh, I'll just leave it at that. Um, that's right. Hook them horns. All right. Uh, so we had some interesting news that you delivered um, yesterday, Bon Temps, when you were at the seventy sixers Clippers game, which was I'm not sure it was kind of a pillow fight, but the Sixers. Uh, or uh, the, the Clippers really needed that win, um, and they got it, and it was another messy ref- referee situation. But beyond that, yes. we have some we have some long awaited Joel Embiid updates, and um, why don't you tell us what that is and what it all means? Hold on, real quick. You said pillow fight, and the first image that popped in my mind was feathers flying while Kelly Oubre just bashes all the referees. Over <laughs> oh my the god, end. that was that was <laughs> yes, Kelly Oubre after the game. <laughs> Whole bunch of bees flying around. Whole bunch like, of bees. It was like, um, what was that movie? Half baked. Does anybody know what movie I'm talking about? Jackson, you know, half baked. I'm not with the exact scene here. Well, you know, these gentlemen decide to go into business um, selling marijuana. It's a Dave Chappelle movie. Jackson, that's unacceptable. You haven't seen it. Uh, and uh, he quit. This one guy quits his fast food job, and he goes and he says. Bleep you, bleep you, bleep you. you You're cool. Bleep you. I'm out. There was nobody, there was, none of them were cool last night to Ubre. <laughs> uh, Jackson, Jackson making us all feel old saying that he was one when this came out. Oh, my Jackson. God. Go well, change your diaper. Anyway, uh, Kelly Ubre, unhappy with the officiating over the last minute of the game. And as was Nick Nurse. Hey, Kevin, <laughs> Kevin Scott and his twang did acknowledge that they blew the call. It should have been a, a foul. Yeah, you can update on us on that, Bontemps, real quick. But but Ubre was like, you're a B, you're a B, you're a B, your mama's a B, yeah, your grandmama's a B. I tell you what, you can't bring the family members into it. And, <laughs> and he admitted mo- You can't afterwards. bring mothers or grandmas. Well, then, he, then, he came in, then he came into the locker room, apologized. Or yeah. his conduct said he tries to be better than that, and then said, "Yeah, but they were calling it different ways at each end." So well, it was it was an adventure. I will say this: as a man who monitors the uh, the size of referees around the league, I ain't calling Eric Dalen a B. You can argue Eric Dalen could post your backside up. McMahon. Eric Dalen played tight end at the University of Minnesota. He ain't nobody's B. Well, and the, <laughs> the funniest thing of all about everything that happened last night in our Wednesday night in this game was the alleged hostile return of James Harden by the second quarter was completely forgotten about. And by the end of the game, it was literally the last thing anybody was thinking about, period. Just and became Harden afterwards. Footnote. Harden afterwards pretending like he didn't understand why he was getting booed. <laughs> it was it was a very James Harden. It was a very James Harden. He did uh, play a good game session. and they needed it a good game. They needed him, he so. was and I would say he was fine. I, well considering the way they'd been playing recently, that was a good game. There you sure. Go. It was good by their recent standards to barely beat this wheezing Sixers team, which cannot score without Joel Embiid. However, there you Joel go. Embiid is going to Cleveland. He's going to Toronto on this road trip this weekend. Uh, Nick Nurse 
continues to say there is no timeline for when Joel Embiid is going to play. I believe that is because Joel Embiid is going to walk in one day and do this, mm-hmm. and then he's going to play. And so no one really knows when that's going to be. Um, but it's clearly going to be very soon. And he practiced today. Um, nurse said last night there's a very good likelihood that Embiid will be back for the end of the regular season. I think he had a pretty good sense that it was better than a very good likelihood. And assuming there's no setbacks, which obviously could always happen, Embiid, who looks saw him for a minute in the locker room last night, looks very good, looks ready to go. We'll see when he decides to be ready to go. Certainly for the Sixers, who have been playing better lately, even though the wins haven't come, they've been guarding really well. They've just, when they've struggled in games, like they played competitively with the Lakers and lost, they played competitively with the Clippers and lost. They've just run out of gas offensively. Certainly adding 35 points a game could really change that pretty dramatically. And That's the diesel, baby. And when you look at the bottom of the Eastern Conference right now, Philly obviously really would have loved to have that win last night, would have been in a tied in the loss column with Indiana for sixth, who they don't have the tiebreaker with, but they play Miami, who they're currently in a battle for seventh with next Thursday in Miami. We'll see if Embiid's playing by then. Um, we'll see later today what the injury report says about tomorrow. Um, though I, I doubt he plays in this game Friday, but Embiid's on his way back. And for all these teams at the bottom, gives Philly a chance to maybe get the six and get out of the play in. If he's able to play and be healthy and play real minutes. And for the teams at the top, if you look at a first round series against a healthy Joel Embiid, that's a lot more difficult than a typical six, seven, eight seed that you're going to get. Well, this is kind of on schedule, right? Bontemps, like when, I mean, obviously nobody wanted to be tied any, any timetable, but they pretty much thought that around the beginning of April, if there was no setbacks and seven weeks this week from the procedure, surgery, whatever you want to say that he had on his knee. And it's about eight weeks since he got hurt. So yeah, I mean, it's right around roughly the timeline you would expect. And now he's got three weeks to get ready for the plan and the playoffs. And look, we know that Embiid is fragile. We know that his knees are fragile. His feet are fragile. But there are plenty of examples, both in the NBA and in <clears throat> other sports, where a player gets part of his meniscus trimmed, which is clearly what happened here. I know that they were afraid to say the word surgery. That was about procedures mm-hmm. and whatnot. He had surgery. Very, very likely had his meniscus minorly trimmed, which is worrisome long-term, but short-term enables a quicker recovery. And I have not seen Mr. Embiid play recently, but if I was a 76ers fan, I would be optimistic that things are going well because he's hitting it on schedule. And I would believe that he could relatively pick up where he left off. You know, I, there's rhythm issues, there's conditioning issues and whatever. Um, the 76ers aren't out of anything. They're going to have their hands full if they play the Celtics, but they would have had their hands full if they played the Celtics with Embiid playing 75 games. Sure. And yep. um, and I think Embiid said when he talked to you, to you and uh, some other media a few weeks ago, and I know this is what a star player would say, but he said, I don't care what our seed is, just get me in. And if he's able to come back here, as you've said, and play some games and be a difference maker in some games, he can help them get into that top six and avoid the play-in. I think that's absolutely doable. So I well, actually even think, if he, yeah, even if he's back by next Tuesday when they play at home against Oklahoma City, they have one back to back left. If he plays every game after that, besides the back to back, which you'd assume he'd probably miss one of those games, it gives him six games to get ready for the playoffs. And if they get out of the plane, it gives them a full week of practice to ramp up. If they don't, there's another game or two before they play in the playoffs. But that that's a decent amount of time for him to get his legs under him, not saying it's ideal circumstances, but it's not like he'd be walking back in to the first game of the playoffs without playing, you know, sort of like the situation Carl Towns is probably going to have to do, where if he's able to come back, it's going to be sometime during the actual playoffs. You're talking about three weeks to get ready for the playoffs. And again, this is a guy in Joel Embiid, who when I sat down with him in December, we've talked about it literally for years now, he and I, The thing he has always wanted is to get to the playoffs healthy and feeling good, 
and ready to go. And he has not had an opportunity to do that yet. And obviously it'd have been better if he was scoring 35 points a game the last couple of months and healthy because it's super fun to watch him play. But if he is feeling good now and he gets through the next couple of weeks without any setbacks and he gets to the start of the playoffs healthy, then he's got a chance to answer a lot of the questions that have lingered around him over his playoff performances in the past. And like you said, especially if they can avoid the eighth seed, like they play Milwaukee in the first round, they're not going to be scared. They play the Knicks, they're not going to be scared. They play the Cavs or the the, the, the Magic, they're not going to be scared. Like they're certainly going to think they can beat any of those teams and we'll see if they can. I Listen, obviously this is a hell of a lot better than him not being able to come back at all. It's It's a long, long way from the worst case scenario, but saying that he can maybe pick up where he left off, that is insanely optimistic. Insanely. Oh, I'm not saying he's going to walk in and I think 40 points a game. I think it's reasonably optimistic. Holy crap, dude. Pick up where he left off. He left off scoring at a historic pace. Literally only Wilt in him had scored more points per minute. He left off at an MVP level to come back from procedure, opera, whatever you want to call it. And think you're gonna just slide right back into that, man? That's putting a well. I don't think he'll do that because I don't think he's gonna. I think his minutes are gonna be kept down. I don't expect him to have the same scoring numbers, but I I've seen players recover from this surgery, and he wouldn't be doing this unless he felt good about it. No, I look. I I I I agree with that. But typically, when guys come back, not only is there a ramp up process, but man. How many times have you seen a guy coming off of surgery, even if it's something like those off season they had to recover where, you know, the first month or so of the season, they get off to a slow start. I just, it's, this is still a really, really tough situation for Joel Embiid. Well, to it's have a tough to... situation because the East is very, it's going to be a hard road for them, but if I was a Sixer fan, I'd be optimistic about the the but about the Embiid that I was getting back. That's what I'm saying, because I'm I, saying I've seen guys come off this injury and be able to bounce back. Well, and look, the other thing is too. Let's be honest. We're talking about a guy who's used to coming off of injuries. This is not somebody who is, does not have experience ramping up from it. Unfortunately, he's got a lot of experience ramping up from injuries. And this is a this is going to be a loaded comparison. I will say that before I say it. But I went and looked it up. When Michael Jordan messed up his navicular bone in 80 for the 85 86 season, he came back in mid March, about a month before the playoffs started, and he had a very, very, very gradual ramp up in minutes. But then he played around 30 minutes by the end of the regular season. And then when he got to the playoffs, he was playing 50 minutes a game and scoring 60 points in. Playoff games against the '86 uh, Celtics. I'm not. I think that's. A, not, I think that's a fair comparison because Jordan came back, ramped up, and got swept by the Celtics. I think that's a very fair comparison. <laughs> well, I'm just. I'm just saying. He. I think when you're. You're. You, if he's able to come back in the next week, you're talking about having six, seven, eight games, and a whole week if they get out of the play-in, to get himself ready to go for the first round. And by the way, the first round also takes a month. So yeah, I, I, my, let's put it this way. Let's this. put it this way, McMahon. I feel better about Embiid coming back and being able to contribute than I do Julius Randle because oh, yeah. I've been around for a while and I've seen guys come off of shoulder injuries and I've seen guys come off of meniscus trims. That's all I'm saying. I, I just, if Embiid comes back and doesn't play at an MVP level in the playoffs, look, there, there's going to be a lot of, well, he's not played an that. MVP level in the playoffs. I, when he's been full I and, actually and, and disagree. That part man. of it, I just, I just, I think we've got to be fair to this guy and understand what a challenging situation this is. To me, I think this is a free role for Embiid because if, like, there, nobody's going to criticize him if he doesn't come back and average. I mean, I shouldn't say that. I'm sure some people will That'll criticize be criticism. him. Reasonable people are not going to criticize him if he comes back and is not averaging 37 points a game in 35 minutes, right? right? But if he is able to be healthy and come back and play great, it's an opportunity for him to address some of the main criticisms that have been leveled at him, which is that his playoff performances have not measured up to 
his regular season performances. Doesn't mean he will, yeah. but it's he's he's got an opportunity to do that as opposed to having another season end early with injury. And there's enough time before the end of the regular season that I think, as Brian said, I do think there's a reasonable outlook for him to have time to ramp up and be at least ready to be something close to what he normally would be for the playoffs. Also, I think just in general, it's a free roll season for the 76ers because when they made the Harden trade, they positioned themselves to really make a big acquisition going into next season. Mm -hmm. There's pressure on Daryl Morey in that front office to, to use that cap space and the assets that they have, those draft picks to really add to this roster. Um, One thing I'm going to get your opinion on, Bon Temps. So um, Joel Embiid is actually contract extension eligible this summer. Um, Extensions are the new thing in the NBA. I think it's going to be rare that we see um, free agents get to uh, or stars get to free agency. If they do get to free agency, I think it'll be because they're on contracts that are outrageously undervaluing them, like a guy signs – um, uh, uh, his first big contract and he way outplays it. Um, and he, he yeah, can't... like Deuce McBride, all star guard for the Knicks. They could <laughs> we should start calling him three Trace million dollars a year. We should calling him Trace McBride because he <laughs> hits six threes in the first quarter, um, yes. on Wednesday night. Um, anyway, obviously sarcasm about the all star part just so people don't freak out, but right. he's playing. Very um, well. and Embiid has three years left on his contract, and normally you would never get to a you'd never really have a conversation about an extension in that zone. However, he is eligible for a contract extension and considering everything. uh, And by the way, it's humongous numbers. Um, It would be two years, according to Bobby Marks, it would be two years and 129 million. And again, it would be for years. It's an average of 65 million a year. It's just for for people at home. 64 and a half, I should be, to be clear. It's a lot of money. Um, And it's... To start in twenty nine in two thousand twenty I'm saying nineteen two thousand twenty seven, so like it's not a it's not like if the Sixers are like hey let's just take a, a breath and wait on that and like you know it's not one of these situations where if he doesn't extend or they don't offer it or whatever it's like oh my gosh. However, if you ask me if I would like to add a hundred and thirty million dollars to my contract years four and five from now. I might like to have that conversation, especially if I've got a history of knee injuries. It, you can move the comma a little bit for me and I'll pounce on it. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of it. I was so, going to say a lot of it. <laughs> so like, I just want to bring up, I'm not asking you to say what you've heard unless you have heard something. I just want to put not that on the, any, old, will, on the old radar. Will, well, uh, here's what I will say. I have not asked anyone with the Sixers or Joel himself about extending. I will go back to what I said before about Joel Embiid walking in and giving the thumbs up and then playing. I suspect if Joel Embiid walked into Daryl Morey's office and said, I would like $129 million, I suspect he would get it. (laughs) 128.9. I suspect suspect that would be given to him if he asked for it. And I don't, then to be clear, I have not talked to anybody. I do not know. But I think if Joel wanted that extension, I would guess it would get done. Listen, we're we're not that far removed from vultures around the league circling, waiting for Embiid to ask out. So yeah, it would make sense for the Sixers to to pounce on that. Um, th- by the way, is Paul George going to be an exception to your rule of stars not hitting free agency? Maybe. So Paul George has a option in his contract um, this summer. He doesn't necessarily have to be a, a free agent, but. Um, Considering everything, I think his preference is to get a new deal. Uh, Kawhi Leonard got a new deal. Um, I was there in L.A. the day it was done, and Kawhi came in after the game and um, talked about uh, his new contract and said sort of, maybe flippantly isn't the word, but sort of nonchalantly said, Mm -hmm. yeah, you know, uh, James and Paul are going to resign too. And I was like, oh, that's interesting. Because I think the question was asked, did you communicate with Paul and James before you did this extension? And we've talked about this. The, it's a very healthy extension. It's three years and over 150 million, but it was not the max. And it's actually a mild. It was like a, like a couple million dollars. When you're making 50 million dollars a year, you know, going down two million dollars isn't you know worth um, you know sounding alarms. However, he did take a mild pay cut, 
And uh, so that set the standard for what those negotiations would be. And naturally, the media asked if he had discussed with those two guys because Paul George had aligned his contracts with mm -hmm. uh, Kawhi in the past. And Kawhi said, um, we're all three going to sign back. Maybe that wasn't the exact quotes, but that's, that is a factual representation of what he said. Right. And I know that my uh, um, eyebrow went up. I was like, oh, okay. And now they can't sign Harden to an extension during the season. Um, that's not permitted by his style of contract. So that's not surprised nothing's happened there, but it's now been three months, give or take, and there's been no agreement on Paul George. And the word in the NBA is that they're apart. That's not mm -hmm. like, let's have a big problem. They're apart. And well, to remind does... people, Kawhi signed for less than the max and less than max years. So that's right. Matt, less than there, max years if, too. if you want to guess where there could be some potential friction, I don't think it's hard to guess where there could be some potential friction on a Paul George negotiation. Right. And and he can extend his contract all the way through June 30th. And then on June 30th can pick up the option for next year um, and then negotiate a contract extension later. Like, uh, But he does have the option of turning down that extension and becoming an unrestricted free agent. And there are a couple of teams that would have the 50 ish million dollars needed um, to offer him a max. And one of those teams, assuming that they say goodbye to their other free agents, assuming they say goodbye to Buddy Heald, assuming they say goodbye to Tobias Harris, which I think that they would in this situation, they, the 76ers, could open the space for Paul George. Um, I think the league believes that Paul George wants to remain a clipper. Um, and there would be concern in the league um, about recruiting Paul George, especially if you had to give away players to open up space, if you were simply being the stalking horse. Um, uh, we've seen this before uh, in the NBA. The one time that comes to mind, I think the Phoenix Suns thought they, were, they had a real shot to sign Blake Griffin. Um, I can't remember the players they moved on from. It wasn't like Hall of Famers. Um, and then Blake canceled the meeting and re-signed with the Clippers because once he got legitimate all, all interest from another team, the Clippers turned around and gave him the money. Um, it's a different front office, but um, so I just thought, I, I think that's something that is interesting to talk about whether it actually play out that way. I don't know. My, uh, you know, informed speculation is that eventually Paul will agree to a, a deal with the Clippers it may not be for the full max, but it may be for more than what the Clippers have been offering. That would be my 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 irresponsible speculation. We love that. is that Daryl Moore is going to have all the information he needs to have before making any decisions on whether to wave farewell to Tobias Harris and Buddy. Hill. Oh no! Oh no! No no! <laughs> Excuse me, sir. Excuse me, sir. In the James Harden's negotiation situation. Having been penalized a second round draft pick for tampering the year before, Daryl Morey declared all rules oh, yes. will be followed. And, and, and listen, and he James was, Harden he will not. Up, he was James, hooked up to a uh, to a polygraph at the time. That thing was just steady Eddie. Yeah. It, no, Daryl Morey told James Harden, "We are not going to be able to offer you a contract until uh, you know July first or June thirtieth at six o'clock," which is why he picked up the option, which started this whole process. So, I assume that Mr. Mori will follow the same rules when it comes to any sort of negotiations with any player and not he, he, even begin to discuss with Buddy Heald or Tobias Harris anything before June 1st at 601. No, that's what one, they rather significant, one rather significant difference here, which is that James Harden had one suitor and Paul George has multiple suitors. Well, I'm well, obviously listen, being... Morey, I know you are. Morey's I know you are. I'm just saying. You know. I'm sure Adam Silver had a stern discussion with Daryl Morey and threatened to take away another second round pick if he doesn't stay on the straight and narrow. Yeah, the the Knicks are still recovering from the second round Ooh, pick they lost from the boy. tampering on Jalen Brunson. That was a tough one. Those those knuckles one. are still raw we'll from the slap that the league <laughs> that the league gave them. Um all right. Um 
Speaking of uh, interesting contract extension, dudes, um, Friday, when the Sixers play in Cleveland with or without Embiid, they will uh, the expected return of Donovan Mitchell from dealing with his nasal fracture and knee soreness um, is expected. The Cavs uh, had a brutal loss to the Charlotte Hornets on Oof. Wednesday night where um, I think they scored four points in the last seven minutes, but I'm not sure they got a, even a good shot in the last four minutes of that game. Um, and we have an interesting interview today from Dan Gilbert. Now, Dan Gilbert, unfortunately, the Cavs owner, Dan Gilbert, unfortunately, suffered a stroke in 2019. Um, he has given very few interviews ever since. Um, maybe one or two. He's spoken publicly a few times, but where he actually takes questions, it's very rare. <clears throat> um, he has very much, unfortunately, he's been away from the team a little bit more last year because his son, Nick, was ailing um, from uh, a condition he had that, that caused him to unfortunately grow numerous tumors in his body. And he'd passed away last year. They dedicated the season uh, the Cavs have to Nick. Uh, or actually, they dedicated, they dedicated last season to him. And this year, they retired his bow tie because he was the famously was on stage wearing the bow tie when the Cavs uh, won the draft lotteries. Um, but Dan has been more around the Cavs this year. Um, and he gave an interview. Uh, to the Associated Press. The reason he gave the interview is because Detroit is hosting the NFL draft in a couple of weeks. And he, as uh, one of the biggest real estate real estate uh, owners in Detroit and one of the city's biggest benefactors, is a big part of that. He gave the interview to Larry Lage of the Associated Press out of Detroit. And he was asked about Donovan Mitchell hmm. and his, the possibility of him signing a contract extension this summer. And Dan Gilbert said, quote, We've been talking to him for the last couple of years about extending this contract. We think he will extend. I think if you listen to him talk, he loves the city. He loves the situation in Cleveland because our players are very young and we're just kind of putting the core together that clearly that he's clearly the biggest part of. Um, that is the Donovan Mitchell uh, contract extension has been a little bit of a third rail topic in Cleveland throughout the year. Uh, Donovan has not really discussed it at all except after the early part in the season, which is where he basically said Cleveland's wonderful and I look forward to being here and let's concentrate on the season. Um, well, uh, I would say there's reason to ask him about it again if the man who owns the team is on the record. And that will be interesting because uh, maybe Donovan will say, yep, I'm looking forward to that day. Can't wait. What do they want at, at four years? Let's do her up. Uh, maybe he's going to say that, and maybe it'll be wonderful. And maybe he's going to be noncommittal. Uh, well, and and I I know, you know, I mentioned those vultures that were circling the Embiid situation. They're still circling the Donovan Mitchell situation. Now, that doesn't mean that he won't sign the extension, just right. like it, you know, it obviously didn't mean that uh, things weren't going to work out with Embiid in Philadelphia. I mean, these teams, The anytime there's a star who might uh, end up on the trade market, these teams have to do their due diligence, you know. Um, but he, Donovan Mitt, when you're talking to teams who are are hopeful to be in that market, uh, Donovan Mitchell is one of the first names to come up these days. Yeah, I mean, look, it's certainly true. It's been the case the whole time. And, you know, I do think as – we have talked about on here before. I do think things have trended in a good direction for Cleveland as far as keeping him this year. It, I think the still the same challenges that existed when the Knicks were not super aggressive or as aggressive as they could have been about trading for Donovan Mitchell a couple of years ago still exist. The fit of him and Jalen Brunson, while both terrific players, is a bit clunky in terms of trying to build a championship level team. And the Knicks have Jalen Brunson on their team already, and. So they don't necessarily need to go get Donovan Mitchell and exhaust their trade assets when they can wait for something else. And, you know, you look around and there's not necessarily an obvious landing spot for him to go. Now, that all being I, I, said. I would say this. There will be no shortage of teams that would be interested in, in being. Well, that, yes, but I'm what I'm saying is from a place that he's necessarily going to want to be longer term in terms of having the assets to trade for him and him ending up there. We'll see what happens. But what right. I was going to say was we have a long way to go as far as how the story of the Cavs season is written. And 
as you mentioned, Brian, they have really scuffled lately, really since the All-Star break in general when Donovan started missing games. They've had several rough losses. This lost last uh, Wednesday night to Charlotte, chief among them. And let's see where they finish. If they end up winning a playoff series or two, making the conference finals, something they haven't done in a long time, then that's going to be one ending. Mm -hmm. If they get another, if they have another five game exit in the first round to the Knicks or the Sixers or the Magic or who, the Pace or whoever they play, that's going to feel a lot differently. So, like it often is in these situations, I think they're in a pretty good place right now. But let's see on April 28th where things sit. And I think we'll have a much better idea of whether Dan Gilbert's prophecy is going to come true or not. Yeah. So Donovan is savvy and smart. He is represented by a savvy and smart agent who works for a powerful, savvy and smart agency. And I expect them to handle this savvily and smartly and not lock themselves into anything and not do anything that could be reputation damaging. Um, Donovan is very good at saying a lot of words that don't answer questions sometimes. Donovan is savvy. He extracted himself from Utah and no one blames him for it. No one blames uh, him for it. So, uh, not and, and honestly, that. I don't like, Hey, I don't blame superstars or, you know, all stars. If you, if you want to say he's not quite at that level, I don't, I don't blame these guys for, uh, determining that another situation is it, or for trying to get themselves to a, a better situation for sure. You Donovan's don't have to like it as a fan, but like, right. Just like you don't blame a team when you make a trade that, you know, a guy who had been a, a loyal member of the franchise. And, you know, you mentioned it earlier. Guys, Blake I understand. Griffin. I, I think understand. about Blake Griffin all the time with this stuff. When fans get, when fans go crazy about players changing teams, I just say Blake Griffin very happily re signed with the clip. Yes, he got paid a lot of money. Sure. Be very happily. Resign with the Clippers, Clipper for life, all that stuff. Six yeah, months later, he's playing for the Pistons. Yeah, when they recruited him back, when they did like their presentation to him, they like, I don't know if they actually hung his retired jersey in the rafters or they like mocked I up. I believe they he, did. Okay. I believe they had stuff saying Clipper for life, I believe is what they did. Okay. I could be well, wrong whatever, about that. Well, whatever it was. Anyway. He was reborn again in Detroit. <laughs> <laughs> he like left a... Uh, Nine figure, uh, eight figures on the table to get out of Detroit. Well, uh, with I mean, with all due respect, to everybody. Um, but you okay. know, it's a, look, it's not just the stars. I think about a guy like Dorian Finney Smith, who got less than he probably could have gotten in free agency when he signed an extension. He was very happy yep. to be in Dallas, was a great franchise guy, loved what loved the idea of playing with Luca, exactly. And Finn was mutual, but when it came time to uh, you know, try to find a co-star for Luca. Dorian Finney-Smith had to be in a deal. He didn't see the first year, the end of the first year of that extension, and off he went to Brooklyn. It's it's a tough business. They're all rewarded so very I think, handsomely for like, it. And look, like maybe we get to July and Donovan extends and the Cavs go do their other business. Maybe we get to July and Donovan doesn't extend. And then what happens? Uh, do the Cavs hang on to him and see what happens because he can extend throughout all next season. He's actually got a player option after next year. Um, so he's protected in, 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 in a case of injury, but he's, he's a good enough player where he can be hurt and he's still going to get a big I understand. Yeah. I understand. I'm just pointing that out. But my point is like, if he doesn't extend, it doesn't necessarily mean that the Cavs would trade him, but that would be the prudent thing to do. So just, Gilbert is on the record as saying it. We'll see what Donovan says. He's, I assume, going to be speaking to the media coming back from the injury on Friday. So we will see about that. Um, speaking about uh, agreements, we had the breakdown of an agreement in the NBA Oof. on Thursday where Glenn Taylor, the longtime owner, I believe since 94 of the Minnesota Timberwolves, put out a statement that um, the contractual obligations and selling the team to Mark Laurie, I guess, and A-Rod. I, Mark Laurie is, um, uh, he's the, he's going to be the governor. He would be, he would have been the governor. So. A-Rod you know, was I, making appearances at card shows to, uh, to, 
try to get I, fees to help I'm just, the deal go through. You know, I'm just a believer in not taking the PR of it. The governor is Mark Laurie. The governor of the Mavericks is Patrick Dumont. Mm -hmm. Okay. So anyway, background we're going forward. Um, he said that the the agreement wasn't met by the deadline, and he, the sale is to use a Mark or a, to use a Mikhail Prokhorov. The sale is hereby canceled, <laughs> um, and the team's no longer for sale. And I look forward to moving forward with Mark Laurie and Alex Rodriguez as the partners. Now. I do not know what is going to happen with this situation. What I do know is this. Um, an owner is the owner of the team until he sells the team and the NBA says that person is the new governor. It doesn't matter what you say in a public release. It doesn't matter what a bank statement says. It doesn't matter what's in an escrow account. It doesn't matter what a contract says. It all, you're not the owner until the NBA votes on it and the other owner signs the paperwork and I assume when the money transfers, but okay, those two things have to happen. The NBA did not approve because it didn't get to that point and Glenn Taylor mm -hmm. is not signing off. The reason this, other than you know doing business studies and intrigue here, the reason this is important and the reason we're going to talk about it right now is what it means for the Timberwolves now. And the reason this is fascinating is because, as we've talked about repeatedly, the Timberwolves are headed for a financial cliff when Anthony Edwards, Jaden McDaniels, new contracts come on, Mike Conley's contract renewal comes on, and Carl Towns' contract goes from max to super max, which is like 12 or 13 million of a million dollar increase. They are already into the second apron of spending for next year for a team that has spent, I think, into the tax just a couple of million dollars in the history of the organization, I think just once in the last 20 years. And they've so, got Kyle Anderson going into free agency. He's a key reserve. Monty Morris, who they just traded for, a key reserve going into free agency. Jordan McLaughlin, who not as key after the Monty Morris deal, but still a guy who contributes going into free agency. And uh, the response from Mark Lurie and Alex Rodriguez in their statement, basically they – I'm not going to read the whole thing. The first part of it's basically calling BS. And then they say, Glenn Taylor's statement is an unfortunate case of seller's remorse that is short-sighted and disruptive to the team and the fans during a historic winning season. So they're basically trying to say, Glenn Taylor, you're messing things up for everybody. We're just trying to help this, you know, help position this team to, to keep on rolling. But man, it was always going to be a potential penny pension situation no matter who was calling the shots but now is this chaos and all these billable hours being racked up like, <laughs> hey i'm married to a lawyer there buddy watch it yeah listen i'm married to a lawyer who's does a lot of MA work so you just better watch your mouth uh, oh, i don't yeah. know what MA means minnesota well, listen, what? I mean, well, well the a stands for acquisition which there was not yeah, one mergers minnesota and acquisition, acquisition? <laughs> so, so speaking of speaking of the money, does Bobby Marks, as always, is on top of all this stuff. So the last time the Wolves paid the tax was 2020. They paid $497,000 in tax payments. Glenn Taylor has played, paid the tax four times in 20 years for a total of $25 million. As of right now, the Minnesota Timberwolves have under contract nine players for next season their current luxury tax bill as of right now is 27 million dollars and that's before they fill out the rest of the roster yes. even with minimum players let alone keeping kyle anderson who's a really important player yep. keeping monty morris who they as you said just traded for and is a good backup point guard keeping jordan mclaughlin doing anything else at all anything over the minimum and even if they sign six minimum guys, you're probably adding 10, Whatever. 20, 30 well, they're, million dollars. They're, they're compelled to, to sign like at least four guys at the minimum. Well, yeah. they would have to get up to 13, 14 players eventually. Right. I mean, you're, you're talking minimum an extra 20, 30 million dollars of tax by the time you add in minimum players. Right. So, you right. So they're looking that. at, you know, over 50 million in tax for a guy that's paid yeah. 25 forever. Now, and, one thing and, I will say is this. He... He did, and I'm not, again, I don't know what's in the agreement, and I don't know what they said to each other, so I'm not going to try to guess that. I will say this. This was not a surprise to the league that this sale didn't go through. 
Um, not, not just because Glenn Taylor has been known to change his mind. He's done this. I don't think he's ever gotten this far down, but he's done this a couple of other times. There's been several, several times when he's talked about selling the team and has not. Right. But one of the things that's important here is that he actually has already sold 40% of the team to Mark Laurie. He owns 40% of the team. And that's important for two oh, reasons. Oh boy. One, he's already received, and that, and that was for a $1.5 billion valuation. Now, you can check my math here, Bon Temps, but I believe 40% of $1.5 billion. $600 million. $600 million. So that means that $600 million have come into Glenn Taylor's coffers. All right. Secondly, it means that if the team loses money, he now has a partner that would be responsible for 40% of it. Now, there's all kinds of different things, and I don't know what's in their agreement. Um, if a team needs to typically, again, not necessarily the Timberwolves, but typically in a situation where a team needs to do a cash call, in other words, to go out to their owners and say, hey, we need money for operating expenses. And you know, teams can borrow money. Um, against with the league's credit facility that is they're allowed, you know, there's a line of credit. I don't know where the wolves line of credit is. Maybe they can just borrow it. Maybe they've got money in the bank. They can cover it. But if they are, you know, they, you know, if let's say they lose a million dollars and Glenn Taylor needs a million to fill that gap in theory, Mark Laurie would owe 400,000 of it, you know, for every million. Mm -hmm. And if you don't pay, you lose equity. That's typically the way it goes. So, you could argue that what Glenn Taylor has done here, and by the way, he wouldn't have got $600 million for the 40% of the team if yes, it didn't come along. What did I say? Unless they thought they were getting the rest. Exactly. So, yeah. so the, one of the things that I'm sure, you know, he is just without trying to get myself into out of into waters I don't understand, he is $600 million richer, owns the rest of the team outright. And has a partner on the hook for forty percent of the losses that he didn't well, have look, three I, years ago. I think the bigger thing to talk about is not these machinations. I think the bigger thing to because we don't know how this stuff's going to play out. Right? right, could go any direction. Lori, Lori could say, "I want you to you have to buy back my what I paid you." Whatever. There's going there to be lawyers. Court, whatever. Yeah. Doesn't matter. <laughs> the, I, it, there, there will be, be lawyers. lawyers. And I think there the are lawyers. Thing, there already are. <laughs> the biggest thing, the biggest thing to think about, I think, if you're a Wolves fan or if you're an NBA fan, yep. is like like we we've talked about Minnesota all season as both having this awesome season. Ant Man has really ascended to superstardom. They're playing great without towns. They're hanging in there at the top of the West. It's been awesome. And they've got this thing hanging over them this summer as to what this team is going to look like. And now, as you said before, man, McMahon, the, th the thing to think about is this chaos that's clearly coming because whatever happens here, this isn't over. Now, I'm not saying Glenn Taylor is going to have to give up the team, but there's this, there's going to be things going on from this going forward. And I think the concern you need to have if you're a Minnesota fan is that if you have to deal with all this, all these massive financial questions, and the ownership of the team becomes paralyzed in some legal fight. What does that mean for the team in general? Are well, they allowed look, to spend money on players? Are they allowed to do stuff? Do they have to save money? Like who knows what it's going to be? And and how much does uh, do the playoff results influence all that? There, there's definitely kind of a everybody's guessing, but there's definitely a belief around the league of hey, the the Wolves going to have to make a. a uh, somewhat of a playoff run to justify the expenses of keeping this team together, no matter how the whole ownership mess ends up, you know, being resolved. Um, and then, you know, you get into like, look, Tim Connolly, I would think he's at least gotten a feel for what's the potential market value if he has to uh, cut salary for a guy like. Cat, I think honestly, Jade McDaniel's probably would be a lot easier to trade. Just actually, I on... think Nas. Re if they just if they yeah. had to slice off a piece to to to, to not, not break up their core, they could trade Nas Reed into someone's space. The, and... the 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 flip side of that though is that's cutting the least salary of, among those yes, three. I don't want to trade any of these guys because they're all but good players. I think he makes about 50. I, I don't want to imply that they would literally have to like rip off all-stars. 
but if they have to, if they if they cut if they traded Nas Reed, it would save them tens of millions. Sure. And yeah. that wouldn't get them out well, of the tax, but but, yeah. but you know, obviously, if you're in that locker room, you're like, hey man, we've got a a real contender now. They haven't proven the playoffs are a contender, but those guys in that locker room feel like we are a real contender. We want to keep this thing together. Does that kind of pressure have any kind of impact? Now, <laughs> the I don't think it's going to have any impact on the face of their franchise because I don't think Ant spends a whole lot of time. Do you think Ant knows the, the basics of the second apron? I don't think Ant gives a flying flip about any of that stuff. He'll, I don't care think, when he sees what the roster looks. By like the way, if, if Ant but makes, I'm talking about going to the playoffs, no, I know, I know. Right. I don't think we've, con- we've calculated. Oh, yeah. if Ant makes all NBA. He gets forty million more, not in one win. Ant yeah. makes all NBA. Yes. When, he's making yeah. all the way NBA. this. The way this has gone, the way this has gone, he's definitely make it. I think there's a there. I think they both will make it. I think there's a better chance Tyrese Halliburton doesn't make it than Ant at this point. Yeah, I mean, no, Halliburton Ant is, is absolutely an All NBA player. It is not, especially with the guys who are question. not going to be eligible. I mean, he's and clearly going to be I can in the predict, top fifteen guys. Ha- having interviewed Ant a few dozen times, I can predict. This is what this is. I predict this is what will happen. Hey, Ant, I don't know if you heard, but the All NBA teams came out. You're on the uh, second team, and you just guaranteed yourself an extra forty million. Dope. <laughs> That's what he's going to say. Well, speaking of speaking yeah. of quotes, I thought this from John Krasinski, straight from Glenn Taylor, was rather illuminating. Uh, quote: We're just saying we had a contract with you guys. You've had your time, and this is the end of the contract. And we're just kind of we're just going to kind of go back on running the way running the way we've been run. And then he further said he's not going to put the team back on the market. I just think we've built this team. We've got the players now. And it appears to me that we should have a very positive run for a number of years. And I want to be part of that. <sighs> I don't blame him. He's go. he's in his 80s. And this is the best team he's had in for 25 sure. years. Like, Well, I don't blame him. I mean, listen, also, this, this okay, entire situation I want to be part is a of it. show. I want also, to be part of it. Hey, are you willing to pay what it takes to keep it together? Well, that's, that's the that question. Was, that would, that would be the nice next question. And look, at the end of the day, also, it needs to be pointed out. Mark Laurie and A-Rod, or Mark Laurie, however you want to phrase it, they were trying to buy an NBA team on layaway. It is not a surprise. Yeah, that, that was this a weird situation. been created in chaos. Jimmy Haslam agrees. I think it was like three, four, or three, three five, five billion. Three, five, three, five, five Mark valuation yeah. with, to buy out the Bucks. Bought it, out, bought it out, bought it out quick. It wasn't, check, wasn't on layaway. I can check tell you that. Check clears by the NBA approved. You know, I believe like I wrote the story in March, and he was sitting there for playoff games. Jimmy Haslam. Yes, so. that's the way the the it's supposed to go. Uh, by the way, Rudy Gobert is also eligible for a contract extension this summer. And and, and also just a, another quick by the way, uh, nobody's complaining about the Gobert deal in Minnesota anymore. Oh, I got this figured out. You know what? I can get this figured out in five minutes. Oh, here we go. I, I don't know. Just have, blast. just have Glenn Taylor call Mark Laurie and say, we'll just call you team proprietor <laughs> and everything will work out. Everything I will think, be fine. I think everything will be happy. I, it hey, and by the way, we should Dallas. install we, a tanning bed at the facility and Alex Rodriguez will be happy. Because these poor, poor Timberwolves fans are having the best season maybe the franchise ever had. And it's just been mired in nonstop talk about salary stuff. I do want to, again, emphasize it's been awesome the way they have responded to the town's injury and the fact that we've because we just spent a whole bunch of time the other day talking about this Clippers team imploding. They looked horrendous last night. I know they won. They they would not have beat most NBA teams in the way they played in Wednesday's game. And the Wolves have not only kept up with pace, but they're tied for second and a half game out of first. And are going to be a top three but, team. And can I think I say, it's been awesome the way they've recovered from that. Can I say what I, when in talking to people and when I watch the Wolves, I'm able to penetrate league passes, defenses, and I'm able to watch the Wolves. When when he, when he splits the double team and gets They're, it in the, lane on the league sleep, day. The sleep updates have been replaced with league pass updates. This they, is the day I could watch the Thunder or the Nuggets or the Wolves. They do their jobs. Tim Connolly has built this roster too deep, has done his job. When you watch them play, they handle their business on defense. They rotate, they help each other, they guard the man in front of them. Gobert does his job. 
McDaniels does his job. Carl Towns, when he was out there, he is he has taken a step back to yield to Anthony Edwards. How many times are you going to see a guy in his mid twenties on a super max, even if Anthony Edwards is more talented, willing to yeah. step back to and doing and he's being richly rewarded, but doing his job. Ant does his job. No, he's Conley does do his job. Better. Ant does his job, which requires putting a cape on, but he right. wears that cape quite right. well. This when you watch them playing defense. They they're tough. They are fun they to work, watch play D man. They, they work get after together. It. They you know they just do their jobs. And, and I just look, I respect last somebody year, who does their job. Last year was not a fun year in Minnesota. I mean the Gobert deal looked terrible. He felt all that weight on his shoulders. Literally in the regular season finale, as they're fighting for seeding. Gobert punches Kyle Anderson in the chest on the sideline. Jaden McDaniels punches the freaking breaks his hand on the wall. Breaks his yeah. hand. I mean, they were a cluster yeah. flip last year. Ant had the Ant had the thing in Denver through the chair. Had that whole incident right. too. Oh my gosh, series. I forgot I, about that. I'm not around the team on a regular basis, but I've been around them some. Wendy, you've been around them some this year. It is such a joyous, happy yeah. atmosphere. Those guys. I mean, it is a fun locker Ant. room. It is a Fun team. They play Daft Punk in the post game locker room. Ant is a joy to be around. A joy. Um, I can't wait for America. You know, they'll, they'll face some pressure as he gets up. I can't wait for America yeah. to get to know him more. He is, by the way, I this is the way I felt about John Morant, too. I thought watching John yeah, was, he a, was, was, I remember talking to people in Jaw's second year. Going, you guys have absolutely drafted a treasure. Hold on tight. There's there's an electricity about those two guys when they're cooking. Yes. Like that block that Ant had, like the dunks yeah. he has. I mean, he just there's there's some special stuff that he does yeah. that makes makes it look well. Really and, I, and, and listen, yeah. Jaw stuff went sideways outside of the facility. Jaw as a teammate, Jaw in a locker room, Jaw on a basketball court has consistently been a joy. Uh hopefully. He's gets back past the, the other stuff and he'll get healthy and we'll get back to being all that stuff next year. But and look, Ant's not perfect. There's certainly some maturity. No, I agree. That, that, of course. That I, I didn't want to I don't just because he's a joy to be around doesn't mean he always makes the greatest decisions. Yeah, but is is in in terms of what they have going basketball wise, it's been a lot of fun in Minnesota. Unfortunately, there's a lot of mess when you get up to the the billionaires. Well, or it's a, it's a, it's I the guess reason the non billionaires since they couldn't afford to freaking buy the team. Well, and it is a bit of a credit to them that the reason we are talking about it so much is because a they are so good, and b we are talking about like very significant players here. Like it's it's a credit to them that this has been such a topic for us on the pod because it is one of going to be one of the dominant stories of the off season, no matter what the off season looks like or what the postseason looks like. I mean, it's going to be a huge it's going to be a huge story regardless of how this ownership thing plays out. All right, before we go. Down here in the South Texas air, McMahon. I know we're technically You're in Central Texas. I know we're in Spurs country here. The Spurs played a couple of They're games. trying to claim Austin. Spurs played a couple of games. By the way, I was talking to some people here. Apparently last year when they came to Moody the uh, is it Moody Coliseum or Moody Arena? Um there for their first games, they were like they were like sort of glorified preseason games. Yeah. This year when the Nuggets came in and then uh they played the Nets and that game went to overtime. Um, the atmosphere was totally electric, might have had something to do with a certain tall Frenchman. When um, is a draw. Anyway, what I'm saying here is, uh, in I would say this is sort of Southern Texas, but you're the Texan. Okay. I'm not going to fight you on that. Uh, well, it is Southern Tech. I mean, yes, it is Southern Texas. It's Central in Austin Texas. right now, but anyways, let's not have a Texas Whatever. geography right. lesson. Here. Fine. Anyway, there's excitement about the Houston Rockets. Yes. Uh, who won their 10th consecutive game uh, Wednesday night. They had some fortune smile on them. They were catching the thunder on the second night of a back-to-back. Uh, and Shea Gildas Alexander took the night off with a quad injury. However, they won in Oklahoma. Chet took most of the night off. He only played 18 minutes before fouling out. Fouled out. Obviously, they had a role in that. Chet was awful, but they had a role yeah. in that. The game still went to overtime. However, the Rockets were victorious, and Jalen Green, 37 Ooh, more. We boy. And some big-time plays, and really I'm almost Thompson. won. Thompson, holy smokes. Yep. Should have won the game in regulation. Uh, well, Jalen had a was, shot at the button. 
But well, also they won Alvin the game. Thompson uh, had a rookie moment where he's supposed to take the foul up three and he botched it. But listen, it's been a favorable stretch of schedule, blah, blah, blah. The Houston freaking Rockets have won 10 straight games. The last time they had a double-figure winning streak, James Harden was in, in route to winning his first MVP, and they were in a 65-win season. Yep. <laughs> it was in 2018, but it seems like a million years ago. And, man, there is a ton of excitement. And, and look, the Jalen Green thing there, I would describe it as, like, optimism because he's had stretches before, but he hadn't had a stretch quite like this. And like last night, the shot making and he was, he was lighting up Lou Dort and it's not like Lou had a bad defensive night. Jalen green was just making shots and making plays, but you ask him Adoka about Jalen green. He doesn't, he doesn't talk about the fact that this guy's put up 30 per game over a 10 game winning streak. He doesn't talk about the scoring. He talks about the progress he's made as a defender. As a rebounder, he had 10 rebounds again last night. As a facilitator, you know, making the right reads, he had seven assists last night. Um, I think four of those were in the last, were an OT in the last minute uh, or so of the fourth quarter. So there's certainly optimism that a 22 year old who's had a rocky roller coaster career, but was the number two overall pick, is turning a corner. But the guy they're most excited about is Amon Thompson. I mean, I don't want to, I'll just say this. The Rockets believe and have data to back up that he can be the best non-big defender in the NBA really soon. I I get a little nervous when I hear the Rockets have data to Okay, that, I'm just well, telling you. That, I, I don't, uh, I've heard Rockets shot of, data in the a, past. He's a little... shot away. He's a jump shot away from being a, a an all star for sure, and possibly higher than that. And 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 he might not need a jump shot. But hey, he's well, a really, he, right now. He's, he's, he's got to be. I'm a huge Ahmed Thompson fan. He's got to become somewhat of a jump shooter to be to to truly become that level player. I'm not saying he can't be effective and be good. But I mean, what's he shooting from three? Like 10, 11 for 50? Or He's something like, 19% like that. Or something. Last night, yeah, like that's got to 15. Uh, what it's really interesting now, and we're going to get to a big picture fit question here. It's really interesting now. He's playing center offensively, and him and Dylan Brooks are their defensive stoppers. So, like last night, he's playing center offensively and he's guarding. Jalen Williams, who with Shea out was obviously Oklahoma actually it was it was a great around. opportunity for Jalen in that game. They played him like as the center of the offense down the stretch, and he made several clutch plays, including a three that forced overtime. Yeah, yeah, it was actually a nice moment for Jalen just to to flex his muscles a little bit. But this is a Rockets conversation. But but he all it wasn't an efficient night. He 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 struggled. Uh, and, yeah, but I'm just talking about that they can go to him at the end of the sure. game, and he can. He can get a poop sure. form. Absolutely. I, I also want to say something about Rafael Stone. He hired a coach and then went out and acquired players that exactly fit what the way that coach wants to coach. And that seems like it would be basic. We don't see that all the time. We see front offices and coaches on different yeah. pages routinely. And Dylan Brooks, who, by the way, <laughs> including the last the last few years in Houston, but go on. Mm-hmm. Dylan dropped two three pointers on the on the Thunder's head to start overtime, which basically gave the separation to win. Off the game. of feeds from Jalen Green when they decided we can't just let this guy beat us. So I, no matter what the Rockets become, I respect saying this is our plan, phase two, and executing it. Now, whether phase three is going to be able to happen, that's right. another story. But uh, by the way, Ime Doka should be on some ballots for coach of the year. Well, especially yeah, if, they, if great, they keep winning and they steal a playing spot, I think he has to be. Um, fellas, they're trying to fast forward to phase three, and it is going to be a fascinating summer. Now, this there there are questions about, hey, how much of Jalen Green taking off is about the floor opening up because everything's not running through Alper and Shingun. Let me be very, 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 very clear about that. 
those questions I'm hearing from people from other teams who are looking at the Rockets and evaluating the Rockets. I'm not hearing those internally from people with the Rockets. I'm just saying, though, there, there are those questions. There are questions about, wow, Amon Thompson's really thriving in hey, this role. The, How does that the, work? The Hawks are defending mix? ever since Trey Young got hurt. There you go. Um, so, I mean, it's, it's, it's sometimes stuff like this happens. So I, I, and Shingun had a great year. It might not be over. We'll see how that plays out in terms of his recovery. In hey, terms of hey they, Trey may not be over. They just gave an update where he's moving on to recovery. Well, there you go. I'm just saying there are questions about, you know, how exactly do all these pieces that are thriving right now fit with Shingun as a centerpiece? And look, there were questions about Shingun as a fit going into this season. That's why they ended up getting ditched at the altar by Brooke Lopez. They thought they had Brooke Lopez signed. They moved money. They salary dumped some stuff to Atlanta because they thought they had that deal done. And then Shingun ends up having a a, a great year. Um, but there's still questions as far as like, how does that fit? You know, Ime Adoka is a defense first coach. Um, and then I'll I'd, I'd just tell you this. When we talk about vulture circling, <laughs> some of those vultures have uh, have Rockets gear on because they absolutely want to take a big, big swing in the trade market sooner than later. And they're, they've got a ton of young talent on this roster, obviously. You know, I don't know if both Shingun and Green are, are going to be here long term. My guess, and I emphasize guess, is that one or the other would end up getting moved uh, at, at some point for them when they take their big swing. But they have unprotected Brooklyn picks this year and in 26 and an unprotected swap next year. They've got that as the draft capital ammo, and then a lot of you know intriguing young talent uh, on the roster. If there are stars that that emerge on the trade market, I believe the Rockets are going to take swings, well, and they have enough things. to get to take one big swing. Couple things. I understand the Rockets are playing great. They deserve credit. Uh, they have beaten the Blazers. Kings, Spurs, Wizards, Cavs without Donovan Mitchell, Wizards, Bulls, Jazz, Blazers, and the Thunder without Shea. Yes. So they have had an extraordinarily soft schedule, not diminishing what Jalen Green has done. He was not a good NBA player for most of his career to this point, and now he's been incredible. Wow. He's just been, I don't know about not good. He just was under he's been a, as a He's been pick. generally a bad been, player, and it's been he's been very, not, very not good. He's been inconsistent at best, and he has had stretches where he sizzles and scores. Typically, it tends to happen right around this time of year. This is the first time he has had a stretch of all-around brilliance. No question. He's been awesome. He's been awesome. But this, this again, gets into a situation where we, we talk a lot about teams where you get into a very dangerous spot when you're in the arc of a building team. And I will point to Trey Young and the Atlanta Hawks. Now, it's a little different circumstance because they got to the conference finals, yeah. but they have that breakthrough year. They get to the conference finals. People there get excited. Oh, we have arrived. We're going to go make a swing to take a step forward. They trade a ton of assets for DeJounte Murray, a player that didn't really move the needle for them. They slide right back down, and then they are now stuck in neutral they're out assets in the future. Now we're talking about, do they do something with the Trey Young or DeJounte Murray? What do they do? And now they're stuck, right? But for a, for a Rockets team with a ton of young talent, Amen Thompson, by the way, eight for 55 from three. Like, Maybe. I love him as a player, but that he's just got to become better to really take a huge step as a player. But anyway, they are in a position where I understand the excitement about trying to take more steps forward. But we have talked about this before. There are 13 teams that are going to go into next season in the Western Conference, believe in they should be in the playoffs. So it's going to be hard, no matter what the Rockets do, to take a big step forward. And this, I think the, the where they got to be careful is not saying, hey, we had this great run down the season where they get to 10th or 11th, we got all this excitement, let's go get an impact player and become a 7 seed or 6 seed or 5 seed next year and end up being in 12th again. and looking around and going, oh no, what happened? It's just, it's just a, 
they've got to, I think you, they just got to be really careful because they got a lot of exciting young players. We haven't even talked about Jabari Smith, who's been terrific. He had a three that I year. thought might win the game, but you know, hey, he's been, yeah, he's, I mean, he's taking great, big and he hit another clutch three in overtime. And he's mm-hmm. been he's been really good playing center defensively, and he's basically been a floor spacing center since uh, Shingun went out. And with again Thompson being this lockdown yep. wing defender who plays the five on offense, that's been a really nice fit. They they also Cam Whitmore has been out during the stretch. He is a yep. six foot seven. Big body, the explosive bucket getting machine. Um, Tar Eason's missed almost the whole season. Another really good they young really player. Really like him. Very like they've long. got a lot of they've got some big time young talent. And I'll, yep. I'll say this. Obviously, look, they're not like right now, Brooklyn's eighth in the in the lottery odds. So they're you're looking at a pick in that eight range for them. And then they give up their pick unless it lands in the top four to, to Oklahoma City. I'm I'm not saying that they wouldn't take a player at a they're not going to just give the pick away but they've got a lot of young talent their their preference would be to to add a you know to take a swing with that draft capital instead of continue adding young talent. Uh all right before we uh shut her down just one quick thing Congratulations to Drew Joyce, who has been named the head coach officially Woo. at Duquesne. Oh, he has been. Oh, we good. Talked to, we talked about him, him last week. Uh, he did listen to the podcast after this. After this, he was hoping to be working uh, yeah. on the Sweet 16. Then you jinxed uh, him. Uh, apparently, I didn't. <laughs> um, we yeah, don't root anyway. for other 8 10 schools on this pod, but that's, I'm, you that's know, a whatever. Awesome, that's fine. He got the job. Pretty Cajones awesome. Factor, Cajones Factor player of uh, what, like of March 2003 <laughs> or something. 2000 March March 2000, 2000. March 2000. there you go but it's a, it's a super cool it's a super cool story though and it, it's uh I'm, I'm glad I honestly didn't see that it happened yet that's awesome that he's yeah. getting that job he deserves it with the way they've um built that program past several years under Keith Dambrot so good for good for Drew all right so thank you for uh thank you to first off thank you to Jackson thank you to McMahon thank you to Bontemps thank you for listening and watching with Hoop Collective and we'll talk to you next week adios amigos